today I'm with a very special guest. Her name is Hannah and she's going to show us around Edinburgh. We're doing two videos. The first one is going to be about the misunderstood issues or topics to do with women that we don't really know within Edinburgh. So yeah, let's meet Hannah and start the tour. Hi guys. <laughs> so today I'm here with a tour guide from Edinburgh. This is Hannah. Hello, I'm <laughs> Hannah Mackay Tate. Nice to meet you all. Okay, so we've come to this statue of a dog. What's this, Hannah? This is Greyfriars Bobby. Bobby was his name, and he used to live in Greyfriars Kirkyard or Churchyard, which is right behind us here. The reason he has a statue is basically that his master died when Bobby was quite young, and he was buried in here in this graveyard. And Bobby apparently came and lay on his grave for 14 years until his own death. So he became a pretty famous little dog while he was still alive for his loyalty to the man who'd looked after him in life. But the reason I really wanted to talk about this while we're talking about women's history is a lot of people know little Bobby's story but they don't know that this statue was actually put up by a woman. Her name was Angela Burdett Coots. So she had inherited this enormous fortune from her grandfather who ran a big bank. She inherited in modern terms like 160 million pounds when she was in her 20s. So she really put herself to work with philanthropy. She gave away almost her entire fortune to fund animal charities, children's charities, educational projects, both in Britain and around the British Empire as it was at that time. So I think she's a really amazing woman. She was probably one of the most prolific philanthropists of her era, male or female, and I had never heard of her until I started looking into women's history more. I think she also really lived life on her own terms. She remained unmarried throughout almost her whole life, but then she scandalized Victorian society when she was in her 60s by marrying a man who was in his 20s who had worked as her secretary. So she really kind of chose to live life the way that she wanted to live and I think that's pretty inspirational for a woman in the Victorian era even one who was so rich that that obviously gave her a bit more freedom than your average person. Oh, I see that his nose is a little bit destroyed in heaven there. <laughs> So people love to rub Bobby's little nose. Yeah. I have to say as a tour guide, it is really one of my pet peeves oh, because really? <laughs> I grew up in Edinburgh my whole life. Nobody ever did this. Really? And then I think somebody kind of made it up about 10 years ago. They were like, it's lucky to rub his nose. So I always really try to discourage people from rubbing Bobby's nose. I know people love to do it, but he is a 150 year old statue. And if we all keep touching him, he might just wear away completely. Oh. So come and give him a little wave instead of rubbing him on the nose. <laughs> So this is Bobby's grave. Do these sticks and out of these pennies? Yeah, I've seen people leaving with like pennies. Oh really? <laughs> I don't know what they think is going to happen. Like, <laughs> resurrect them. <laughs> I'm going to play with them all. So we've come to the beautiful St Giles Cathedral. I wanted to stop here to talk about an incredible woman called Dr Elsie Ingalls who had her funeral here in 1917. She qualified as a doctor in the 1890s when it was still pretty unusual for women to be doctors at all and she actually ran a hospital for women and children just down the road from here with her colleague Jessie McLaren McGregor. But the thing she's most well remembered for is her war service. She was a secretary of the Edinburgh National Society of women's suffrage so she campaigned for women's right to vote and as part of that work they set up something called the Scottish Women's Hospitals for Foreign Service. Basically they wanted to send medical units staffed by women to serve at the front during the First World War. She approached the war office here in Britain and they said to her my good woman please go home and sit still. But Elsie was not the kind of woman who would go home and sit still when she had something important to do so she went to speak to the French government instead. They took her up on her offer and she ended up serving across Europe with other female doctors and nurses during the war. Sadly she had to be evacuated back to Britain in 1917 due to ill health and she died in Newcastle upon Tyne just the day after she arrived back on British soil. Although at the beginning of the war they hadn't necessarily been receptive to Elsie's offers of help, by the time she died in 1917 she had become such a celebrated figure that her funeral was attended by members of the British and Serbian royal families. And do you know what she died of? She had cancer. Oh, I'm not she? sure what kind of cancer. What about her legacy then? Is it there? is no longer a hospital. It's yeah. actually a tourist shop now, okay. which maybe isn't the best memorial for yeah. her. 
Um, in terms of her legacy, she used to have a maternity hospital in Edinburgh named after her, okay. which was called the Elsie Ingalls Memorial Hospital. But when they kind of merged different services together, they lost the part that was named oh. after her. So she doesn't anymore, unfortunately. Oh, but uh, there is a campaign to get a statue okay. of her in Edinburgh because we have really almost no statues of women. In fact, we have no statues of women except oh. Queen Victoria. Okay. So. Okay, so we're now standing in the Venel, which is just off the grass market in Edinburgh. It's probably one of the most photographed streets in Edinburgh city centre with its gorgeous view to the castle. But it was also the birthplace of someone called Bessie Watson back in 1900. When Bessie was just nine years old, her mum signed them both up for a suffragette pageant marching through Edinburgh city centre and Bessie played her bagpipes. Her parents had got her started playing the bagpipes because they thought it might stop her from getting TB by strengthening her lungs. But Bessie became a really committed suffrage activist. She would wear hair ribbons to school in the colours of the suffrage movement. And she would even go and play her bagpipes outside the jail where suffragette prisoners were held. She actually went on to become a pioneering female bagpiper in her adult life as well, becoming the first woman to be a member of the Highland Pipers Association when she was just 14 years old. So I think she's such an inspiring person, someone who took up a cause for justice at such an incredibly young age and remained committed to it right through her life. Okay, so she was born here in these steps, this alleyway. <laughs> she was. She was born at number 11 Venel. Oh. So this used to be a much more residential area than yeah. it is nowadays. And back when Bessie was born here, this was an area with a lot of Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants as well. So she would have grown up in a, a very vibrant area with lots of street music and mm. different cuisine and somewhere that was a bit more mixed than a lot of other places in Edinburgh. Yeah, old time was very densely populated, wasn't it? Extremely densely populated <laughs> and especially once a lot of the wealthier people moved over to the new town, there wasn't so much money and time put into taking care of places in the old town, so they ended up kind of cramped and run down by comparison. The thing she's probably most remembered for is her suffrage activism, but she was also a lifelong teacher in Edinburgh, so she was a modern languages teacher teacher and she helped to set up pipe bands at some of the schools she worked at as well so she really went on to have an influence on lots of children's lives even amongst generations who had completely forgotten about her suffrage activism. Okay so where are we now? We're now standing in front of 15 Buclue Place is the building you can see behind me here. This was actually the home that the Edinburgh Seven lived in while they were at Edinburgh University. But I'm actually here to talk about a different woman who came a few decades later, who was also a medical graduate of Edinburgh. Her name was Agnes Yewande Savage. She was a kind of member of a medical dynasty here at Edinburgh. So her father, Richard Akinwande Savage, also attended Edinburgh and became a doctor. Agnes was one of those academically exceptional people who's just like amazing the whole way through school. So she won a full scholarship for George Watson's College, which is a private school in Edinburgh. And when she attended Edinburgh University, she graduated with first class honours and multiple prizes. So one of those like super annoying, high achieving <laughs> people. Yeah. So she is considered to be the first West African woman to get a medical degree from a university. Her father was from Nigeria and her mother was from Scotland. And she was actually born here at 15 Buclue Place in the early 1900s, graduated from Edinburgh University in the late 1920s. So she went after graduation to go and work as a doctor for the colonial office in what we now call Ghana again, but what they called Gold Coast when it was under the control of the British Empire. And although Agnes had been born, brought up and educated in Britain, she wasn't treated the same as the other white European doctors who were hired by the colonial office. So she had a really inferior contract, she didn't get paid the same as them, she didn't get the same kind of leave. And she really spent a lot of her career fighting to get access to an equal contract and equal rights to her white European peers. Mm. And that kind of took its own mental and physical toll. So although she achieved really impressive things working out in West Africa, she was helping to set up and run maternity hospitals. She helped to establish a nursing college in Kumasi in Ghana. And to this day in Nigeria, she's remembered as one of their most eminent citizens from history and the first Nigerian woman to become a doctor. Later in life, she lived 
kind of in West Africa and in Scotland as well. So she was born here and partly raised at 15 Buclew Place. Most of her schooling took place in Scotland as well. But her father was also a politician and a publisher over in West Africa, in Nigeria, which was his home country, and in Ghana as well. So the family did spend time between Scotland and West Africa. But she did end up having to retire due to ill health fairly early in her career in the 1940s. Thankfully she got to have a nice retirement because she retired to the countryside with her friend Esther and their dog who was an Alsatian called Simon and they got to live out the rest of their days in the countryside down in England so thankfully she got a bit of respite at the end of her career but she had to fight ten times harder than a white British man would have had to fight in her position. So yeah this is our final place and it's it's beautiful. So where have you brought us? So we're, uh, we're in the Newington area of Edinburgh. We're standing in front of Salisbury Crags behind us here. So this is part of Holyrood Park where you find Arthur's seat as well. The reason I wanted to stop here is to talk about an amazing woman who grew up in this area in the 19th century. Her name was Eliza Wiggum. She was born not very far from here on South Grey Street in 1820. She came from a family of Quakers. They were textile manufacturers. So like a lot of Quaker families, throughout history they were prominent activists for social justice causes and her whole family even before she was born were involved in campaigning for the abolition of slavery so when Eliza was born slavery still existed across the British Empire until 1833. It wasn't abolished until the United States did so like several decades after it was abolished across the British Empire. So that was really a cause that she dedicated a huge amount of her life to fighting for. She was president of the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society, so women who were campaigning for enslaved people to be freed over in the United States in particular. And as a part of that society, she and her family became friends with Frederick Douglas, who was a famous abolitionist activist from the United States. He had himself been born enslaved and he escaped from slavery and became an anti-slavery activist. He visited Edinburgh in the 1840s as he was on a tour of the United Kingdom and Ireland. And it's even said that Eliza may have been one of the people who accompanied him during a famous incident in his time here when he tried to carve an anti-slavery slogan into Salisbury Crags, which people were really angry about at the time. I think it would actually be kind of amazing if we could mm -hmm. see that today. She also went on to set up the Edinburgh branch of the National Women's Society for Suffrage in 1867. So it was one of the very first women's suffrage societies across Britain. She set that up just after one was started in Manchester a couple of months earlier. And she really dedicated her whole life to campaigning for social justice causes. She also was a prominent campaigner against something called the Contagious Diseases Act in the late 19th century, which was a law that targeted female sex workers and a lot of organisations of women led campaigns fighting against this because they saw it as really unfair to target the women in that scenario rather than the men who were paying them for their services. I just think she was one of those people who kind of quietly and without fanfare devoted her whole life to trying to make the world a better place but never by making it about her. It was always about working with people and trying to improve the world. Mm. And I think there's always something really impressive about someone who dedicates decades of their existence to improving the world for people other than themselves. Mm. I think she's an amazing example of that. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was amazing. I learned a lot about Edinburgh that I didn't know. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun to do this with you. Oh, yeah. And where can uh, people find you? Yeah, so the easiest place is probably just to find me at scotlandwithhannah.com and you can find my Instagram and my walking tours and everything up there. Okay, thank you. <laughs>